James chapter 2, and we're going to begin with verse 14, looking through verse 20 this morning. Now, James ended chapter 1 with a definition of what true religion consists of. You remember there in verse 22, he said, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Then in verse 27 of chapter 1, he says, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. So James' definition of true religion is a religion that has a belief that acts. You're a hearer and a doer of the word. This true religion will minister to the most needy in our body, which would be those that are fatherless. And it said also here that we should keep ourselves unspotted from the world. So ministry to the most needed, and then personal holiness. This is how, Paul, how James defines true religion. Then he makes this incredible shift in chapter 2, and he begins to talk about false religion. And we looked at the first 13 verses here where he addresses and describes and defines false religion as that which shows partiality among us. When we show partiality and we do not love all individuals alike, this is a definition of false religion. Now what James does is he goes on here to describe in very great detail here the root of all false religion. And let's read that here together. Verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or a sister is naked and destitute of daily food and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead. Now, what does James try and communicate here about false religion? In, in reality, what is the basis of all false religion? Well, the message is very simple. False religion will have words, but no action. It's a very simple premise. I call it faith without feet. Just keep that in your mind. Faith without feet or behavior with, uh, with uh, be, or excuse me, belief without behavior that is in harmony. Now, this is something that James makes very clear here. Three times in verses 14, 16, and 18, he says, if someone says... So he is focusing our attention on what somebody professes. What do they say? And then taking action. What do they do? So what I say has got to be in harmony with what I do. And we'll see this all the way through our study this morning. And as we look at other portions of Scripture, you'll see this truth clearly taught all through the Bible. Now, this is a subject that is not going to be a feel-good sermon this morning. I just want to warn you. You're, you're not going to feel all warm and fuzzy after we get done here today. 
I'm going to make you uncomfortable, and I hope I do. Because James wants us to be uncomfortable and to question and to examine ourselves. That is the point of his writing of this epistle. Notice, again, chapter 1, verse 22. He says, be doers of the word and not hearers only. Why? Deceiving yourselves. Verse 27 of chapter 1. Pure and undefiled religion before the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. This is the action that we should be doing. And why? He says in verse, at the end of verse 26, he said, if you think you're religious and you don't bridle your tongue, you deceive your own heart. You see, the whole intent of this epistle is to warn believers about deceiving themselves. So that is my intent this morning. I do not want anyone in this room to deceive themselves as to whether or not they have true religion. Because true religion has action. If you have faith, you're going to put feet on it. If you have a belief, you're going to have behavior that follows in those same steps. And so do you have true or false religion? That's the question. And that is the intent here in this text. Now, secondly, the practical example that James gives here is essential. You see, it's very easy to lay out some concept, some abstract concept, but you have to have a practical example of what he means. And so that's what he does here. He takes the most obvious practical example that you could ever choose to use. And he says, this is what I mean. Notice verses 15 and 16. He says, if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give to them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? So what James does here is he addresses the subject of the most obvious, most basic human kindness that we could offer someone, and that is somebody who is hurting, somebody who has the basic need of food and clothing. If I am a believer and I profess to love God, and yet I do not take the action to help somebody in this most basic way, First John tells us and asks us, how does the love of God dwell in you? The question is answered, it doesn't. If you can't love somebody in this most practical way, the love of God does not dwell in you. So if James uses this example, and John uses this example, Jesus uses the same example. I want you to keep your hand here. I want you to turn back with me to Luke chapter 10. I want to read this entire passage because it is lengthy. Luke chapter 10 and verse 29. This is a very well-known passage of Scripture. You all know it well. It is the story of the Good Samaritan. Now you remember in verse 25, a lawyer stood up and tested Jesus, asking him, what can I do? What should I do to inherit inter eternal life? Jesus said, well, what's written in the law? What is your reading of it? Verse 27, he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered rightly, do this and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, Well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus answered him and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, departed, and leaving him half dead. Now by chance, if that's possible. By chance a certain priest came down the, that road. 
And when he saw him, he passed on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, a Samaritan, oh, these were the people that the Jews hated. And they thought that they were false believers, all of them. Jesus here gives a little different view. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii. This is two days wage. So think about this. What do you make in two days? This is what this man gave. He gave to the innkeeper and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among thieves? And he said, He who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. Very simple truth. Very simple example. Two individuals saw this guy. They did absolutely nothing. They did not render the most basic human kindness and care that they could have. They just said, hey, I'm too busy. And yet the Samaritan did oh, over and above what he could have or should have done. He took care of this man. Why? Because he had compassion on him. Now, Jesus uses this particular story to identify the result, the fruit of someone who has truly inherited eternal life. If somebody has eternal life, this is what they will do with their neighbor. They will show the most basic human kindness that could possibly be given. Now, acts of loving service and giving are not a substitute for faith. They verify that faith is real. And we will see this as we go through this study this morning. But this story is proof that if somebody has truly the love of God in their heart and has compassion, they will act in accordance with that. If you do not have that love and compassion in your heart, you will pass by on the other side. Now, is there a basic human kindness or service that you are refusing or have refused to another? That's the question. Is this the way you live your life? Are you loving others? Will you do something when you know there is a need? Will you stand up, walk over, and say, how can I help? That is is what a believer does. Secondly, is there any righteousness or morality which you are refusing to obey? This is the second aspect that is so important, and the Scripture makes this very clear. Not just human kindness, but if I have truly been saved, I will walk in righteousness. This is the message of the entire third chapter of 1 John. That is what he says. If you are righteous, then you will walk and practice righteousness. And yet many times I have believers, professing believers, say to me, hey, Steve, I, I, I'm a believer, I, I, and yet they're living in immorality. They're living with their boyfriend or girlfriend. They're getting drunk on a regular basis. They are using drugs on a regular basis. They're extorting some uh, money from other people in questionable business practices. I mean, there's something wrong with that picture. You can look at 1 Corinthians 6 or Galatians 5, and you have lists there of immorality. And at the end of those lists, it says... This person will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's that simple. So I cannot practice those 
actions and hope to inherit eternal life. So it's basic human kindness and basic righteousness. These two issues, you must question yourself. You must say, okay, is that fruit coming from my life? Because that is what it requires. Now, your, your works will either confirm your faith or they will deny it. This is what it says in Titus 1.16. It says there, They profess to know God, but in works they deny Him. That's pretty simple. One is a profession. I profess to know God, but the works that come forth from my life, the action must be in harmony with the profession. So, which is the case with you this morning? Do you see actions, fruit, that prove that your profession is real? If you do not, then you have to question the reality of your salvation. Your life must change. If it does not change, you don't know the God of change. You have not had a personal relationship with him. Now, notice here in this particular text, he is addressing the issue, the subject, thirdly, of almsgiving. Now, almsgiving is very important. Now, whenever I talk about this issue of giving and helping others in this way, many times people respond and they say, well, gosh, Steve, you know, does this mean that I should give away anything I have to whoever asks me for what I have? Should I just give everything I have away? And I say to them, no, you should not. You say, well, wait a minute, that seems like a contradiction to what you just said. Well, note here in the text, in verse 16, it says, one who says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but do not give to them the things which are needed. Now, that's a very important little word because you will see that word used many times in reference to the issue of giving or giving to the poor in any respect. It is giving what is needed. Now, when you look at this whole subject, one of the best passages that I could encourage you to read and study on this subject, if you want to learn more about how do you give to the poor, how do you give where there is need? Study 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. Those two chapters give you the most lengthy explanation and instruction on this subject. One passage in the midst of this instruction is 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 13, and it says this. Paul said, lest they misunderstand what he's saying, for I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened. He's saying, don't misunderstand me here. I'm not saying don't give away everything you have because if you do that, then you will be burdened and you're going to have to have somebody else to help you. So he's saying, you know, you've got to keep a balance here. So clearly it is what is the need, not what is the desire. So let me give you four principles that I use personally and that this church uses when it determines and seeks to determine how will it use its benevolent fund when someone comes and asks us for help. How do we make that determination? These four principles, I believe, are essential. The first is we've already addressed is need. Is it a need? Verse 16 of our text here. So is it a need or is it a desire? Well, I'd like to buy such and such. Well, that's just a desire. But do you need food and clothing? Do you need to keep the lights on? Do you need to pay your rent or your mortgage? That's the bottom line. Is it a need? Secondly, a person's willingness to work and provide for himself or herself. In 2 Thessalonians 3, 10, and 11, notice this was the issue that Paul addressed when he spoke to the Thessalonian church about how they should give. 
He says, for even when we were with you, we commanded you this, that if anyone will not work. Notice, will not work. There's a difference between ability and willingness. So he says, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. So he basically is telling them, look, do not give where someone is unwilling to go to work. So if somebody is not even out looking for a job, you have to question whether or not they even want a job. So is someone willing to work? And are they searching for work? That is an important thing. The third principle is the ability and the willingness of a person's own family to help them. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, there is a passage that where Paul is addressing the subject of when should the church help widows and when should they not help widows. And so he addresses this subject in great detail. He says, look, if that individual woman is in need and she has no family to help her, then the church should be help, should help. If she has a family, then that family should be their first resource of help. Because he goes on to say there in 1 Timothy 5, 8, if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Because even unbelievers will take care of their own family members. But I am surprised, let me tell you, many times have I discussed with individuals in this church when one of their parents becomes ill and cannot care for themselves, all of a sudden they come and they tell me of their, their other brothers and sisters who swoop down on their mom and dad and say, well, let's take all the stuff Let's use the money for what we want and then let's put them in an old folks home someplace and let the state take care of them. Do you know what that's called? It's called fraud. It's called selfishness and greed. And I hope that you will stand up against your own family members and tell them that's wrong because your parents' wealth is theirs. It's not yours. It's theirs. And it should be used to care for them. And it should be used up to care for them. Not so that you can go take a vacation. That's wrong. And so, as a believer, you need to, to see, hey, this is our responsibility as a family member. That's what families do. The fourth principle is discernment and wisdom. In Psalm 112, verse 5, it says there, David says, A good man deals graciously and lends. He will guide his affairs with discretion. So a good man, a good woman, they care and help other people. But it has to be done with discretion. Wisdom, discernment, that's what that word means. Because many times people will say one thing, but your discernment tells you something else is going on. So you need wisdom. And if you will ask from God, what does James 1.5 say? You will be given that wisdom liberally. So ask the Lord for it, and he'll give it to you. Now, this is what should define your alms giving or giving to the poor. Now, while we're talking about giving here, I think this is a very good opportunity for me to stop and clarify one other misconception that is in the body of Christ on the subject of giving. And that is the difference between alms giving and your tithe. These two things are completely different. 
Do you know that the majority of the New Testament passages that speak about giving speak about almsgiving? I said the majority because there are many passages in the New Testament that speak about tithing as well. Now, that's the first misconception because many times people say, oh, tithing, that's Old Testament, man. That's Old Testament stuff, you know. That's, that's back under the law. and the, that's, Nobody's putting me under the law, Steve. But it is before the law. Do you realize that? There was a man of faith. His name was Abraham long before the law was ever given. And what did he do? In Genesis 14, 20, it says that he gave tithes to Melchizedek. He gave tithes. If you look, Isaac, his son, gave tithes as well. Scripture declares it. Jacob, his son, gave tithes long before the law was ever given then tithes are referred to in the New Testament as well. Several places. Jesus spoke about tithing. Jesus spoke about tithing? Yeah, he did. Also, Paul spoke about tithing and referred to tithing as a means by which those in ministry should be paid. 1 Corinthians 9.13, that principle is clearly intended. Also, Hebrews 7, 5. But the most important passage in the New Testament is what Jesus said. Matthew 23, verse 23. Let me read it to you. He said there, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. So he commends them for paying their tithes, but he reproves them because they have missed the weightier matters, the more important issues of justice, mercy, and faith. And I think we would all agree justice, mercy, and faith are more important than tithing, right? But notice what Jesus goes on to say. He says, these you ought to have done, referring to the justice, mercy, and faith, without leaving the others undone. He says, keep right on tithing. That's right. But don't forget what is really important. So this is a subject that is clear. In Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 through 10, one of the most important passages of Scripture on this subject. It says, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. Now, this is the Lord speaking. He says, you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? And the Lord responds, in tithes and offerings. And he says, the result is you are cursed with a curse. You have, been, you have robbed me, even this whole nation. He says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. Now, what are the sto- what's the storehouse? Well, notice he goes right on and he says, that there may be food in my house. This is what's called a synonymous parallelism in Hebrew. And so the storehouse is his house. It's where the food is stored and where it is dispensed. So I tell people, look, you need to tithe where you're being spiritually fed. That's the bottom line. This is his. That first 10% is his. And you know, I'll tell you, my wife and I have tithed since we were married, the first day we were married. And we started with absolutely nothing. And the Lord has blessed us immensely. And I believe it is for that, it is because of that very thing. You have to learn to give. Jesus, or the Lord says here in Malachi 3, It says, try me now in this, says the Lord, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Jesus said the very same thing in the New Testament. He said, give and it shall be given to you. Pressed down, running over, shaken together, overflowing 
That's the way he said he would give. So, robbing God, you don't want to do that. I mean, wouldn't every one of us in this room think it would be wrong to go bust open the offering box in the back of the room there, just grab a handful of money and walk out? Wouldn't we say, oh, I'd never do that. But if you do not tithe, you're doing the same thing. It's that simple. You say, wow, that's pretty heavy. It is. This is the only place in the scripture where God says, you just test me. You just try me and see what I will do. So I would encourage you, if you think that's just Old Testament stuff, study these passages and pray about it. Do you know that only 5 to 7% of believers tithe? That's according to Barna's latest st- statistics. 5 to 7%. There would never be a missionary unfunded. There would never be a social need in a community if people died. Not one. But the reason why there is such difficulty is because many have not learned this lesson. So I encourage you, consider this. One last passage, Galatians 6.6. 6. In the New Testament, there... Paul said, let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. So again, the same principle, wherever you get fed, that's where you should die. Now fourth, how should you reconcile James and Paul concerning justification? Notice at the end of verse 14 here, it says, can faith save him? Now that's a great question. Can faith alone save you? Well, that's a question you have to answer. And you have to answer that biblically, weighing all of the Scripture. Now, Jesus said in Luke 7.50, remember there the woman who came in and she began to kiss his feet while he sat at dinner with the Pharisee. She was kissing his feet. She was weeping. Her tears were washing his feet. That meant that she was really weeping profusely. And then she would take the hair of her head and wash his feet. Jesus said to this woman, Your faith hath saved you. Go in peace. So Jesus answers this question very clearly. Yes, faith can save you. But you say, well, wait a minute. It appears here that James is saying that faith alone can't save you because he goes on to say in verse 19, you believe that there is one God, you do well, even the demons believe and tremble. Literally, it means or shudder. Now, yes, the devil believes in God. He has belief in God. Every demon has a belief in God. But belief in God is different from putting your trust in him personally and obeying him. When you truly put your trust in him, you will take action. You will obey him. You will follow him. And so the balance here is very important. The the context always is the key to understanding this truth. If you look at the context here of this woman coming to Jesus, does she have fruits of repentance? I would say so. I mean, she has godly sorrow. She has repentance. She has confession. She's acknowledging to Jesus her sin. To that individual, Jesus said, your faith has saved you. You are forgiven. Now, Paul is arguing against people who are trying to earn their salvation by good works. And he is discussing individuals who are trying to justify themselves before God by their good deeds. And he makes it very clear that that cannot occur. No one can justify themselves with God by something, some good thing that they do. 
Paul said in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Well, boast where? Well, boast before God. No one can come and boast before the Lord that they have saved themselves because we are saved by grace through faith. Romans 3.28, Paul said, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. So Paul makes it very clear that you can be saved by faith alone apart from any action that you do. And so this is essential. But you say, well, wait a minute, Steve. This just seems like totally contradictory to what James is saying. Well, not so. Look at the context of what James is teaching. Paul is addressing my relationship vertically with God. What is James talking about? He's talking about my relationship horizontally before men. One is justification before God. The other one is justification before men. Where do you see that? Well, look, verse 18. He says, but some will say, you have faith and I have works. He says, show me. Show me. Not show God. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. So James is talking about justifying and verifying that someone has faith on the horizontal plane, relationship with each other. I mean, how do I know you're a believer? How do you know I'm a believer? Well, there has to be action and fruit. God knows my heart, so he doesn't need to see anything. He knows whether the heart is right. One is the vertical relationship. The other is talking about the horizontal relationship. And when you realize that, it's clear. Then they are not a contradiction to each other, but a complement to each other. And so here, the claim of salvation verbally is proven by what you see to another individual clearly taught in verse 18. Now, fifth and last here, notice the balance of Scripture on this subject from Jesus, from Paul, and from James. Let me just read to you a couple of passages that make this absolutely clear so that you can see that the rest of Scripture speaks about Profession and action having to go together to have a real salvation experience. First, Jesus. Matthew seven twenty one through 23. Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Now notice, he's saying, This is what people are going to profess to him. And what is he going to look at? Whether they do, whether they take action on the will of his father. Not just talk about it, but do it. He says, many will say to me in that day. Now, that's a scary word. Many. Many throughout the churches across our land, around the world, are going to say to him one day, Lord, Lord, we have, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Why? Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You see, here's the issue of immorality that we spoke about early. Now, you have the issue of basic compassion and kindness, but the issue of holiness and morality. You need a transformation in both areas. So he says here, you practice lawlessness. That means that there are going to be a lot of people who have believed 
professed belief in Jesus, have done labor and worked for him, who are going to go to hell. There's a whole lot of preachers that have preached in his name and done miracles in his name, and they're going to go to hell. That's what Jesus is saying here. That's why I say this is a very sobering passage of Scripture. It makes me say to myself, I don't want to be in that many. I want to be in the few. Jesus said there is a narrow road that leads to life, and few there are that find it. There is a broad road that leads to destruction. And he said, many will go in on that road. So this is serious stuff. Now, Paul on the subject. Titus 3, verses 5 through, 7, 5 through 8. Titus 3, 5 through 8. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, and have been justified by what? His grace. We should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now notice this. This is a faithful saying, and these I want to affirm constantly. I want you to affirm this constantly, Titus that those who have believed in God should be what? Careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. So Paul here believes in the issue of grace, and he says if you have truly believed in him, then you need to maintain good works. There, need to be, there needs to be fruit, an action that follows that faith if it is real. In 1 Thessalonians 1, 3, Paul again said to that church, he said, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, your patience of hope. Faith works. True faith always has work. It always has action. It always ha brings a change of behavior. Then last, James has made this incredible statement about faith and works. But notice what he says. We'll look at this in our next study. Verse 23. And the scripture has, was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for what? For righteousness. You see, he believed that righteousness, true righteousness, came by faith and faith alone. But that real faith will bring forth real action and a change of life. And that is James' message. So I encourage you today, you need to see that change of action in your life. There needs to be fruit that will change the way you live. And that can only be, be produced by true faith by a true surrender in your heart to him. When you make that surrender to him, it naturally happens. Why? Because he comes inside to live in you and to live his life through you. There, there cannot be Christ living in somebody's life and he not change them. It cannot happen because he's real. And you've seen it in other people's lives. You've seen it in your own lives. You know that that is the case. So trust him with all your heart. Surrender yourself to him. And let him do that work in you and through you. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we believe, Lord, that you are real. And Lord, that you change lives. And Father, for all believers here in this room this morning. Lord, we just want to give you praise because we can look back and see the incredible change that you have brought about in our lives. And we can do nothing but just give you thanks. 
for the work that you have done. We know that this is not of ourselves. It's, a, it's something that you have given to us as a, as a gift by the power of your Holy Spirit. You took us, Lord, from incredible corruption and you have transformed us and you have made us new men, new women, new creatures in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you would continue to do that work in each of us today. Lord, help us to look to you for that transformation that is so needed. Lord, where there is little fruit being seen, Lord, for that believer, I pray that you would, you would just bring repentance today, honesty, surrender. For those of you that are here in our midst that do not know Christ personally, you've never made that commitment. I want to give you that opportunity right where you sit this morning to make the change, to start on that path of following him. But that means you have to admit that you're a sinner. You have to believe in your heart that he died for your sins. He's your savior and that he rose again. Do you believe that? Do you believe he took your penalty for, for your sin? Well, if you do, then just confess your sin, ask him to forgive you and invite him in right now. Let him take over your life. And the changes that I talked about here this morning will begin. Do you want to do that? If you do, pray with me right now. Say these words to him from your heart. Just say, Lord, forgive me. I acknowledge my sin. I believe you died for me. Jesus, come in, take over my life. I want to turn from my sin. And I want to follow you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit right now. I want to live for you. Are you praying that? If you are praying with me and you just prayed that prayer right now, I just want you to acknowledge that you prayed with me by just lifting your hand. You're a simple acknowledgement. God bless you. God bless. Who else? He loves you. He wants to change you. Lord, we pray that you just touch these hearts, Lord. Touch these lives, Lord. You are the changer. You're the one who changes us. Begin that work. Fill with your Holy Spirit and give that assurance of salvation. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.